Today we're going to talk about lateral stability. Before doing so, I'd like you to try to recall what was the stability criteria for the longitudinal stability. There was a derivative, and what was that derivative? Just take 30 seconds and think about that. So remember that as we increased angle of attack, we wanted a pitching moment to restore us. So that would have to be a negative pitching moment. So it was DCM, the derivative of the pitching moment coefficient, DCM d alpha. Right, with respect to angle of attack had to be negative. So DCM D alpha was negative. And because we use these a lot, we use a shorthand and generally just refer to it as CM alpha. So as the angle of attack increases, we want a negative pitching moment to restore us back to our, uh, our neutral position. Okay, and we're gonna look at a few of these other criteria for um, lateral stability, uh, both for um, rolling moments and yawing moments, which we'll just see here in a second. Just trying to share my screen. Sometimes it doesn't want to work. Okay, there we go. Okay, so first let's define these coefficients. We've talked about pitching moment coefficient. Um, there are now in the lateral direction two other moments, so about our three axes. Pitching was about the longitudinal axis. axis. So rolling a moment, imagine we take a axis out the nose of the airplane. Rolling moment is a moment about that axis, this direction, and it's often given the symbol L, but to not confuse us with lift coefficient, I'm just going to write it out as roll. So um, the rolling moment coefficient is the rolling moment normalized by dynamic pressure and the wing reference area as normal. And remember for pitching, I put a W just for a wing here. This is a reference area. Remember for pitching moment coefficient, we also had to normalize by chord um, and we used the mean aerodynamic chord. For rolling moment by convention, we use the wingspan. And that's just because for a rolling moment, right, the chord, changing the chord doesn't affect my rolling inertia very much, whereas changing the span here, right, has a, has a big impact. Uh, yawing moment, now imagine an axis coming out the top of the airplane and we're going to pivot about that axis. That's our yawing moment a moment about that axis. So it has the symbol N and it's going to be defined very similarly. We're also going to use uh, the wingspan because again the span is going to be more relevant for that yawing inertia as compared to cord. Okay and so these three moments right there are three forces, three moments, forces, you know we could say lift drag, side force, and moments, uh, rolling moment, pitching moment, yawing moment. Um, we, we generally refer to these as L, M, N, right? Rolling, pitching, yawing. But uh, like I said, because L for rolling moment can be confusing with lift, we'll just write it out here. So now we wanna look at stability criteria, first for yaw and then we'll look at roll. So let's look at the yaw stability. Um, imagine my airplane, it's, as you can see, it's faced along this dashed line here. But instead of the wind speed coming directly towards me, let's say the free stream wind speed is coming at an angle. So that can happen easily as I'm flying straight along when there's a crosswind, right? There's a cross uh, gust or breeze that comes along and now my, the, the total vector for the wind is coming in at an angle. This isn't really desirable. Um, I mean, this is gonna happen, but we would like for there to be some stability in our aircraft that our aircraft is gonna reorient itself to, to be stable and not, not continue to fly. What, what you can see we're happening here is if we continued with the side slip, we'd be flying upward on this page, but facing at an angle, so it'd be side slipping. We wanna turn back so we're facing forward into the wind. Um, this angle here, beta, is called the side slip angle. So, Alpha was our angle of attack in the longitudinal direction uh, relative to our wind, and beta is the side slip angle. So before we get into like a, a derivative to define it, let's just think physically. What would you do to your airplane design to try to make it reorient itself into the wind? Just take 30 seconds, a minute, just think about what could you do to make that happen? Okay, the conventional way this is done is with the vertical tail, and you can, this is kind of depicted right here, this is sticking up out of the page, right? This works the same way as uh, fletchings on an arrow, or sometimes you've seen these small turbines, they've got a tail back there. But what's happening is 
if I'm oriented to the wind, say the wind is coming this way, then the wind is oriented with the, uh, you know, the angle of attack of that vertical tail zero. It doesn't produce any forces, nothing happens. But now, since I'm flying at an angle, right, here's V infinity. I'm just copying it over here at the tail. Uh, now that um, airfoil for my vertical tail is at an angle of attack. So you could tilt your head, kind of look at it this way, and think about it as an angle of attack, which means it's going to produce, remember it's always going to be perpendicular to that, it's going to produce a force that is perpendicular to the free stream. This is the lift force that the, the vertical tail is producing. Okay, And if my center of gravity is, say, up here, this is, you could think of it as the pivot point for the airplane. Now I'll think about the moments, the R cross F. If that vertical tail is behind my center of gravity, it's now going to cause me to rotate back this way, and I'm going to be facing back into the wind. So I've got this natural directional stability uh, by having the vertical tail, and that's the primary reason why we have the vertical tail. So as far as the derivative goes, um, the convention actually for a positive yawing moment is this direction. Um, and so and that's, that's exactly the direction that we've drawn it here. So what we want is uh, the derivative of that yawing moment with respect to beta, I'd like that to be positive. Or in other words, when I've got a positive beta, as we've drawn it here, that's the direction is for positive beta, and I want a positive yawing moment, just like this, to develop to counteract that, okay? And again, using our shorthand, we'll often call this CN beta. Okay, so this is the criteria for directional stability. Um, we usually want this, so we talked about criteria for uh, CML, for our longitudinal stability, you know, what kind of a good number is. It's a bit harder to get a good number for yaw and roll stability, but let's just say probably around, say, 0 0.05 to 0 0.15, where the angles and radians. Uh, this is different from some of the others where there's not necessarily an upper limit that's, that would be desirable for uh, longitudinal stability, and we'll also see for roll stability. You don't want too much, you don't want too little, but you don't want too much. For yaw stability, you generally, there isn't such a thing as too much. Like if you could have more for free, you'd just take it. That doesn't mean you just want these huge vertical tails because of course you're adding weight and drag, but if somehow you could magically just get more, uh, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, so the vertical tail, uh, what was I gonna say about that? Well, I guess, one thing to note about the vertical tail, like we said, it's kind of a lot like um, the fletchings, those feathers on the back of an arrow, same idea, right? That's why this is also sometimes called weathercock stability, because um, you see that on those weather vanes, right? They'll have this tail behind the CG, same kind of reason. Um, the vertical tails, though, if you look at commercial aircraft, they're quite large, and it's, because, it's not necessarily because of this. They need the tail for this, but the tail is bigger than you would need just for yaw stability. Generally, the reason why it's so big is because you need, um, during takeoff, uh, where you're going at really low speeds and you can't generate a lot of force, if there's a crosswind or whatever and I need to deflect the rudder, I need to stay straight, right? I need that rudder to have enough authority. So to get the forces that I need at those low speeds so that I can get you know, enough force to generate for my rudder, we need a pretty large vertical tail. So it's really more of a control thing as to why it's sized as large as it is as opposed to stability but we still do need it for stability. Okay, well, uh, here's an airplane that doesn't have a tail. Uh, this, is, this was a famous example, a B-52, that encountered some pretty strong air turbulence. This is kind of an aside just uh, here, but uh, they had really strong, air, clear air turbulence, something like 100 miles per hour, and they actually had to change the regulations because at the time they didn't know that, you know, the turbulent gust could be that large. So we needed to redefine some new safety standards. As you can see, the vertical tail was almost completely lost, uh, which means most of the yaw stability was as well. Um, so, you know, this was a success story here. They coordinated with uh, Boeing engineers on the ground to try to figure out how to, to land this thing. Um, take uh, 30 seconds and think about what would you do? What would you suggest? What are some ideas about how to uh, regain some of your yaw stability and safely land this. Okay, so some things that they did, um, perhaps one that you can 
see from the picture is they lowered the landing gear, right? This, as long as that landing gear is behind my CG, which it will be in this case, it's pretty far back there. Uh, not as far back as the tail, but it's far enough back. That acts like a tail, right? It's the same kind of effect. I've got this vertical tail, so that could give me a little bit of that yaw stability. You also, with many of these aircraft, have the ability to move your CG a bit because you pump fuel, so you can move fuel forward, let's say, and get that CG forward so you can have a bigger yawing moment there. Um, another thing to do, you have engines on both sides. You can use what's called differential thrust, so I would throttle up one side more than another to create a yawing moment. And so they did all these things and a couple other things. Um, speed brakes is another, you might have seen on the wings, we can deploy these flaps, same kind of idea. I could increase the drag on one side versus the other, create the yawing moment. So they were able to land safely. It took about six hours, but uh, some quick thinking and coordination between the pilots and the engineers were able to land this. Okay, let's look at roll stability. Roll stability is a little harder to visualize um, as compared to uh, uh, yaw stability and maybe a little less intuitive. Okay, so let's, let's imagine we're flying into the page here. I have a bank angle now. That's what this phi is called. This is the bank angle. So that's the angle between, uh, let's say, a reference line on my wing, you know, sort of my horizontal line of my airplane, and then the horizon. Okay, so I can uh, have this bank angle. The perhaps somewhat less intuitive part is that the bank angle has nothing really directly, at least, to do with my roll stability. Uh, certainly my bank angle does cause me to roll, but my stability is not about the bank angle. Why is that? Well, I've tilted my forces, um, but remember that the bank angle though, it, so, so this whole stability is about the wind, right? It's about my angle of attack change, which is a wind, my side slip change, which is the wind angle change. Uh, bank angle actually has nothing to do with the wind. It doesn't know anything about the wind. Um, and gravity has nothing to do with it, the weight of the airplane. I say here's the weight, has nothing to do with it, what that orientation is relative to where I'm flying has nothing to do with it because weight always acts through the CG or the center mass by definition. So it can't change my moments. Uh, really what's happening actually is that we're gonna create a side slip because of that rolling moment. And so indirectly, because we create that side slip, we now uh, are out of our equilibrium and we're gonna need to create a rolling moment to reduce that side slip. So let's see how that happens. So the lift of my wing as I'm flying, right, is gonna be up, but as I tilt, my weight is still down, but my lift is gonna be tilted at an angle. So the lift vector, uh, let's, let's try to align it here better. My lift vector is gonna get tilted. And this is in fact how we turn, um, just for sake of drawing this, right? Uh, I have got the vertical component that still needs to support my weight, but now I've created a horizontal component. So just as you learn in physics, this creates a centripetal force. And now I can go in a circle. Imagine going to the page, right? And I fly in a circle. And if I kept coming, I could come all the way back around. So that's actually how we turn an airplane. It's not from yawing. Sometimes we might originally think that it's not like a car, right? Where we turn in this axis here. It actually doesn't uh, generally help you turn unless you have a really small, like RC plane, sometimes you can get away with that. But that's just going to cause you to have a side slip. We actually roll the plane that tilts the lift vector, I get a component of the lift vector that's providing a centripetal force, and now I can turn because I've got this force that's going to accelerate me in a circle, and I'm going to start turning, right? Okay, well, the problem with that, I mean, not necessarily the problem, but the consequence of that is that I am now accelerating to the right, right? So I'm uh, moving to the right, right? So my airplane's moving to the right, so the wind is now from the perspective of the airplane now coming from right to left, right? So because I, since I'm accelerating left to right, it appears as from the perspective of the airplane, I've got wind coming from right to left. So if we go back, that's exactly this case here, right? Where I was going forward, but now I added this component of wind that's coming right to left. So I've created a side slip. So again, if we were to look at the top view here of this airplane, um, let's just draw a really lousy airplane real quick here. I was going forward, but now because I've introduced this side slip, right, I've got this side slip angle that's that I'm flying at. Okay, so uh, I need to counter that somehow. 
Um, I need a rolling moment. So this is a positive side slip. I need a rolling moment that's going to counter that. And based on the direction of the rolling moment, uh, remember that the positive rolling moment, this is a um, positive rolling moment. Uh, if we look at that, because I'm side slipping this way, I actually need a negative rolling moment to counter uh, the side slip. So I need C roll, or sorry, the derivative of C roll with respect to beta to be negative, or in other words, or sorry, in another notation, we'll just say C roll beta is negative. Okay, uh, sometimes this derivative, and, and again, we call these derivatives stability derivatives. Sometimes we call this effective. Actually, I'm going to save that for a second. Uh, let's again talk about what the or, uh, a good range should be. Again, this is hard to define, kind of like the lateral one. So we want it to be negative, but we don't want to want it to be too negative. If it's really negative, then our um, our, uh, our airplane is too sensitive when we're trying to turn. Right? It's it's going to be hard to control. It really wants to move back, and it's not going to let us turn because we do need to do this uh, roll. We do need to side slip for a little bit. Uh, we just want it to then then be stable and kind of reorient us back. So general range is maybe say from, again, roughly speaking, zero to minus 0 0.1. Um, one of those ones that you don't want too much and you don't want too little necessarily. Okay, so how do we get more roll stability? If, just like we looked at the uh, yaw stability, to get more yaw stability, generally the main way is to create a bigger vertical tail. How would you create more roll stability? Let's see if you can think about that for a second. It's perhaps less obvious how this would work, um, but the most common way to do that is with dihedral. Um, so here's a picture of dihedral. Uh, if I had zero dihedral, my wings would be flat level to the ground if I was you know, facing forward. So uh, with dihedral, right, I can lift these wings up. That's my dihedral. And so here in this diagram here, what we're showing is the difference between these two angles. Oops. Um, bank angle is my orientation of, say, this just horizontal line of my airplane um, with respect to the horizon. And if I had no dihedral, my wings would be perfectly aligned with this line. But my wings are tilted up somewhat, so I've got this dihedral angle. Uh, so what can I do about that? Well, or why does that help? Remember, if we look at the last picture, because we have that rolling moment, we created this apparent wind coming from right to left. So from the perspective of the airplane, there's this wind that's coming from right to left. And I, I'm going to draw it here along this axis this way. Right? It's, it's going to be, um, I guess we could draw it different ways. This is, so it, it is actually coming to, from the horizontal, but the uh, vertical component isn't really going to matter in terms of our forces. So I'm just going to draw just the part that's acting along that horizon. Now, if I have just dihedral, and that's just a velocity component moving along my wing. But if I have dihedral, notice that I could break that velocity component into a component that was uh, perpendicular to the wing and one that is parallel to the wing. And this is a bit hard to see. If you go look in the book a little bit, think about this. Um, hopefully it'll make more sense, but I'm just gonna give you this quick version here. Effectively, what's happening is that because of that dihedral, I get this net effective upward force on one side and the downward force on the other. And so because I've got this upward velocity on the right, down on the left, it's actually gonna to wanna to restore me back naturally anyway. So having some dihedral is one way to increase my um, roll stability. And that's why roll stability is also sometimes called effective dihedral. You don't always have to have dihedral to have it, but that's one way. Another common way is by adding winglets. If I put winglets, right, so on the, where a winglet is, if this is my wing, these vertical, they don't have to be vertical, they could be canted or tilted, right? But these um, winglets at the end of my wing, that has a similar effect to dihedral, right? and, and we call it an effective dihedral. So it's just really a consequence of that, uh, there's a component of the velocity that is kind of pushing up on the wing because of dihedral. All right, so if you need more roll stability, either generally increase dihedral or think about some winglets. Um, that's one of the primary pur purposes of winglets. Winglets can help us reduce, as we talked about, reduce induced drag, but um, you can also do the same thing just by making your tip, uh, your, your span a bit larger. Um, and 
often more effectively. So a, a good reason to use winglets though, uh, that you can't do with just span is to increase that lateral stability. One sort of side note here with a uh, roll, um, just of interest is this uh, effect called adverse yaw. So if I roll, remember I wanna roll to turn. So let's say I'm rolling here to the right. And so what happens, how I actually do this is I'm gonna change the deflection of my ailerons uh, in different directions. So I'm actually gonna uh, move the aileron down on this left side here. That's gonna increase the camber of my wing on the left and increase the lift. And on the right side, I'm gonna move the aileron up. So that's gonna actually, so if I was to draw like a front view of the, uh, this side, right, I take this wing and I deflect this aileron down. So I've increased my effective camber. And also on the right side, took this aileron and deflected it up. That actually is gonna decrease my lift, right? It's gonna be a poorly performing airflow. So I increase the lift on one side, decrease it on the other. That's gonna initiate this roll. The consequence though, is that since I've got more lift on this side, remember induced drag was proportional to lift squared. So I'm creating more drag on the left side as compared to the right. And so since there's drip more drag going this way, pushing me back, then I'm gonna to wanna to yaw this way, right? As shown in this arrow here. So even though I'm, I'm rolling, I'm trying to turn to the right, my nose is actually gonna to turn to the left. And so if we wanna create what's called a coordinated turn, I need to use aileron and rudder deflection together conventionally, right? So I use these aileron deflections to initiate a roll, but that's gonna to wanna to force me to turn away from the turn. So I'm gonna to have to deflect rudder at the same time so that my nose also starts pointing into the turn. Otherwise I get you know, this adverse, uh, well, I have to counter this adverse yaw. All right, so uh, to wrap up, we're gonna talk about um, briefly about different tail sizing. Um, there's this uh, nice figure from uh, Dan Raymer's book and we're not going to talk about all these configurations. I'm just going to highlight a few, maybe big picture design, uh, design decisions. Uh, tails are kind of like a fuselage. You don't want them to be any bigger than they need to be, right? Because they're just adding weight, they're adding wetted area. So you want them for the purpose that you need them for, for stability, but not any bigger than you need them to be. Uh, let's just talk about a few of these conventional, we've kind of seen T-tail. Why would you want the uh, horizontal tail up higher? Well, one reason is that we can get it out of perhaps the wake or the boundary layer of the fuselage, maybe out of engine exhaust so it can operate in cleaner air, maybe more effective. Um, it also acts like a end plate or a winglet on the vertical tail. So it makes the vertical tail more effective and maybe doesn't need to be as large. Uh, it has its own challenges though. One challenge is if you've ever, you know, use one of these toys or just maybe observe this, if you have say a long stick, uh, a beam or whatever, and you put a weight on the end, that thing is gonna to want to, you know, you oscillate a little bit and it starts bouncing around a lot. So it's prone to what's called flutter where it can get these induced vibrations and, and start deflecting uh, large amounts. It's also can be a bit dangerous from a deep stall. So imagine this tails up higher and I get into this high angle where I get stalled and now I'm stalled, but the wake of my wing because the tail's so high is sitting right in that wake, whereas conventionally it would be, you know, the wake would be coming up here and be below it. I can get, depending on the design, where I'm in this sort of high angle attack stall and my tail is completely blanketed by the wake and now my elevators are not effective and I can't create the moment I need to to get out of that stall. So that can be dangerous if we're not, you have to be careful about the design when you're doing that. Um, cruciform tail is kind of a compromise between conventional and T-tail. Uh, so some of the pros and cons of both. H-tail, uh, similar to the T-tail in the sense that, uh, but in opposite sense where by putting the vertical tails um, at the end, we increase the effectiveness of the H tail, kind of like a winglet. Uh, so we can make them a bit smaller, generally. Um, we may also be able to get uh, these vertical tails out of the way, you know, of prop wash or, uh, you know, engine exhaust, boundary layers. And so they may be more effective. Um, v tails can be interesting because they have, uh, they're a little simpler. We don't have as many surfaces. And they can also help with ground clearance. We have more space here. We're not maybe as worried as striking them uh, on a rotation or whatever. Uh, we have to a little bit, they're a little more complicated on the control side because now we've got to mix our, um, our control surfaces. We don't have this separate sort of rudder and uh, elevator. We have to separate or sort of mix them. You can see a bunch of other type of things here. Um, 
I'm going to mostly refer to you on the book on this, but I just want to highlight what's happening here. Remember last time when we derived uh, the pitching moment for a for the horizontal tail, out came this term here. It looked like this, and we called it the horizontal tail coefficient or volume coefficient, sometimes called the volume coefficient because it's like a unit of volume over a unit of volume. It's just something that appeared out of the equations, but uh, sometimes in early stage design, um, these coefficients tend to fall within a fairly predictable range and so it can be useful for initial design. Again, this is not this is not going to get you all the way through design because you actually need to go do the stability analysis, but it can be a, sometimes a good starting point. Assuming that your airplane is similar to things that have been done in the past, right? If there's something that's very different, you don't want to rely on statistical approaches. If we did a vertical analysis, you know, or, or we can come up with basically the same kind of coefficient and a similar idea to help size a, a vertical tail. And again, I want to stress these are not, this is not like a physics-based derivation that your numbers should be in these ranges. These are just based off of historical data of many airplanes that they tend to fall in these ranges. Not an excuse for not doing design, but a good place to maybe start, especially if your aircraft is uh, not too dissimilar from things that have been done in the past. Um, we've talked about these, but I just want to make sure we're really clear on this. Uh, simply, these are the normal controls uh, that are used for any conventional airplane. Elevators to control the pitching moment. We need them back, you know, far back, or it would be more effective if they're far back to create the pitching moment that we want. Ailerons to control roll, and again, we want them far away, right, uh, to create a large rolling moment, and this is why we talked about the dangers of tip stall. If I'm stalling here, then my ailerons may be ineffective and I can't get out of that. Uh, I can't control my ailerons in turn. Rudder, right? Uh, this is gonna be creating our yawing moment. Um, so we want that to be, uh, you know, up here on this vertical tail, far back as well, right? To create the kind of moment. So the further back, the better for in terms of moments, but of course that creates more weight in the forward area. Large aircraft, of course, are going to be more complicated and have all sorts of control surfaces, um, maybe an inboard aileron, an outboard aileron, so that you don't completely rely on uh, the outboard aileron, and all sorts of other flaps. So last, we're going to talk some more about these later. Um, uh, yeah, we weren't going to get too much of it into too much of this right now. Okay, so that's going to wrap up the static portion of our stability. Next week, we'll uh, give a brief introduction to dynamic instabilities. If you'll remember from our discussion, we looked at kind of a convergence where static stability, the plots just asymptoted down that was static stability. But dynamic stability, even if we're statically stable, we can overshoot, be statically stable, but we could be either dynamically stable or dynamically unstable, even though we are statically stable. So we really need to check both. All right, so we'll see you next time.